Welcome back. So excited I get to share more recipes with you. If you don't know who I am or didn't see my first show, I'm Jennifer Basil. I'm a chef from Dallas, Texas. I grew up in New York and Italian is my favorite cuisine. So we are going to work our way from the north to the south of Italy. Today we're starting in the north. We're going to make a traditional asabuco, which is one of my favorites. And we're also going to make a nice soup with vegetables, minestrone. I am so happy that I get to share this recipe with you today. We're gonna to make asabuco. It is a traditional braised dish that they make in Northern Italy. And I actually created this recipe for a little competition show that I've been on, um, but didn't get to actually execute it on that show. So I'm so glad I get to share the recipe with you today here. So what we're gonna start with is some veal shanks. We're going to truss those up with some twine. We keep them together so that they'll cook evenly and they won't fall apart while they braise. This dish actually does take two to three hours in the oven. It's a slow cooking dish. If you have a pressure cooker though, and this is how I actually um, will have my recipe posted, pressure cooker, you can actually get this done in like 35 minutes. It's like a super easy trick. But today we're gonna do it the traditional way. We're gonna slow braise it in a Dutch oven. So to start, we want to truss these little guys, and all that means trussing is just to tie these together. So we'll take some butcher's twine, and we'll tie these little babies up. And you want to make that knot tight, again, because we're wanting to compress the meat and make sure that everything gets cooked evenly. And then once we have those all tied together, we're going to season them with salt and pepper. And then we're gonna put them in some flour so we can get a nice brown on them when we sear them. That's our first step. All right. And you know what I love about this recipe too? When these are done cooking, that bone marrow in the center of the bone, it kind of gets like butter. And um, one of the favorite ways to eat this for me is to take a nice slice of rustic bread and actually use that like a butter. So you have a bone marrow kind of butter that you put on the bread. So delicious. So we want to season with salt and pepper. And I season every layer. So we're going to do some salt on the actual shank. And some cracked black pepper on both sides, because we're going to sear it on both sides. And this meat can kind of be tough, so it's important that we um, slow cook this so that when it comes out, it's nice and tender. All right. I love the smell of fresh cracked black pepper, although sometimes it makes me sneeze. Okay, so we're gonna put a little in the flour. So the flour seasoned as well. A little mix. And if you're anything like me, I always, let's see if I can keep from getting flour on my dress because I always end up with flour handprints all over me. <laughs> all right, so I'm just gonna dip, dip that in flour. That'll give us a nice brown crust when we sear it. Okay, so we've got our veal shanks over here ready to put in a hot pan to get a nice sear on them. And of course, as I walked over here, I noticed I did get flour on me. See, this is why I don't bake cakes for a living because I would be covered. Okay, so once we get our pan hot, we're gonna put a little bit of olive oil, just enough to coat the bottom. And then I have a trick to get a really nice brown sear. I add butter because that butter will turn brown and you'll get a better color than you would with just olive oil. So we'll take a little bit of butter. Put that in there, let that melt. And I've got this on high. I started to heat the pan without oil in it because if you're doing this at home and you're anything like me, I will forget that I turned the pan on, the phone will ring, I'll go answer my phone, and I'll come back. If there's oil or butter in the pan, well, now you got a fire. So I always heat the pan up first, let that get hot. 
then when you're ready to start to sear, then put your oil and your butter in. That way you won't cause any fires. I mean, unless you have really cute firemen in your neighborhood and you want them to come over and eat some of your cooking, you could do that. <laughs> okay, so that sizzling, a little bit longer, so it gets a little brown. And then we were gonna put these in. And depending on the size of your pan, you don't wanna crowd the pan. So even though I have three, I'm only gonna sear two at a time right now. If I put that third one in, it's gonna create too much moisture coming out of the meat and it'll just be gray. You won't get that nice brown sear on it. And then I've got a Dutch oven here. I don't know why they call it a Dutch oven because it's not an oven, it's a pot. But we've got a Dutch oven here and this is what we're gonna use to make our braising stock. So actually, while those are searing, we can get started on that. So we are going to, again, turn our pan on, let it get hot without the oil. I'm gonna take a second. Put our oil in. I've got Traditional mirepoix, so I've got carrots, celery, onion. I like to add red bell pepper to mine. It adds um, some sweetness and a little bit more earthiness to the dish. We're gonna use garlic, we're gonna be using bay leaf, thyme, and rosemary. We're just gonna put all that in that pot. And that's where all that flavor is gonna come from. And we'll make a sauce out of it at the end. Okay, so let's start by putting the onions. I always like to put the vegetables in that um, take the longest to cook. So onions, celery, carrots first. We're gonna sweat those down a little bit, which just means we don't want them brown, we don't want them cooked, we just want them to get translucent and softened. So we'll get that going. Now's when I would add my garlic. I always like to add garlic after I already have something in the pan. Garlic will burn very easily and that creates bitterness in your dish. So, and depending on how much garlic, I use two cloves in this recipe, but you absolutely, if you love garlic, put as much in as you like. And Halloween, I think, would be coming up soon in the fall, so, you know, a lot of garlic, it's good to keep those evil spirits away. All right. Those are beginning to get softened. We've got a nice color, kind of translucent. We'll add the red bell pepper. Let's check our veal shanks. Um, oh, see that side's getting more color. There we go. So we're just trying to get a nice sear on these. You're not trying to cook them through. So see how we've got that nice caramelization right there? I think that was touching the pan higher than the other ones because this is kind of the low side. So it's okay, we can flip them back over if we need to get that other side a little more brown. Look at that marrow, oh, that's gonna be so decadent when the dish is done. You can also take a spoon and just scoop it out and eat it that way. All right. It's got some good color on it. So if we were doing this in the pressure cooker, same idea, you don't actually have to um, do it in separate pans. I would do the browning of the um, veal shanks in first, get that oil in the bottom of the um, pressure cooker, brown these, then we're gonna dump everything else in the pressure cooker, seal it, let it go, 35 minutes, you pull everything out and it's done. I'm glad we don't have like household smoke detectors in this kitchen because it would probably be going off. I wish somebody would invent one that says, we're just cooking, so it would automatically turn off. <laughs> All right, we'll get this last one browned. There we go, look at that. Beautiful, okay. Now, turn this off. Leave it off the fire. Well, there we go. We're gonna add fresh rosemary, two or three sprigs, a couple bay leaves. I love thyme, so lots of thyme. Seems like we don't have enough thyme these days. 
And then we're going to pour in some chicken stock. I've got about two cups. And then my favorite, I've got a nice Tuscan uh, red wine here. You don't have to use an Italian wine, although if you're cooking Italian, you might as well use an Italian wine. It's a Sangiovese. We're gonna season this now with some salt and pepper. And when this comes out, you can adjust the salt and pepper once you see how we make the sauce. I always put on my recipes salt and pepper to taste because you want to salt and pepper while you're cooking, but you may need to add a little bit at the end, um, and so that's always to your taste. All right, that's ready to go in the oven. It's that simple. I'm gonna cover that. We're gonna put it in the oven. I've got the oven set at 350. You can do it 350 or 325. Um, it's a low, slow break. So this is gonna take a couple hours. So while that's in the oven, we're going to make our next recipe, which is minestrone. All right, so we're still in Northern Italy, and the food in Northern Italy is a little bit different than the rest of the food as you move south through the country, and that's because they're in a mountainous region with valleys, so a lot of the food is stick to your ribs kind of food. It's that comfort food that's kind of warm in your tummy. So we're gonna make a vegetable soup because they use a lot of vegetables in Northern Italy, and we're making minestrone today. So we've got same thing we're gonna start with. We're gonna do onion and carrots and celery. That's actually called Holy Trinity. In France, I call it mirepoix, but you know, we're in Italy, so it's the Holy Trinity. We've got some barlato beans. We've got diced tomatoes, some tomato paste, just to give a little bit of um, consistency and thickness to the soup. Some stock. Usually a minestrone has some pasta in it, so we're gonna use a ditalini pasta. This is already pre-cooked. It's cooked uh, about two minutes under what the package would have said, um, just so that it doesn't get mushy and overcooked in the soup. And we're gonna add some cabbage as well. And then one thing that I like to do is actually put the rind of some pecorino cheese, which is also from that region um, in Northern Italy. We'll put some of that in the soup as well, which is gonna give it a really nice, robust flavor. So we're ready to make our minestrone. This is a wonderfully rich, hearty soup. We're using traditional ingredients today, but this is a soup that you can be versatile with. So let's say it's springtime. You can use asparagus, you can use peas, you can use those things that are available to you at that time. And we're actually gonna finish this off with some pesto. So I'm gonna show you how to make a traditional uh, pesto from Northern Italy as well, once we get this soup going. So we're gonna start, um, same thing, we wanna go ahead and sweat our Holy Trinity, so a little bit of olive oil. Turn our pan on. I'm gonna turn that flame low since I have a cutting board here. Don't try this at home. We're gonna cut some rind off to put in that soup. But we're not gonna use it just yet. Okay, we've got that going. Add our onion. And Usually when I dice my vegetables, I like to dice them all the same so that they cook evenly. But in a soup, I like to have different shapes. So we did the celery on a bias because then you'll have that pretty cut in the soup. Because we want the vegetables to shine in this dish. So you really want to make them stand out. Carrots we did in circles. And again, we just want to get those softened a little bit. And now we'll add a little bit of garlic. Let the garlic soften up as well. Oh, just smelling that, it smells good. Okay, we're gonna add our other ingredients. I'm adding in the ingredients, the longer they cook, they go in first. So the last thing we're gonna add is the cabbage and the chard because those we just want softened, we won't, don't want those to overcook. So we're gonna add some diced tomatoes. These are Barlotti beans. Um, you can find them at Italian markets. If you don't have access to that, you can also use a pinto bean. These are very similar to that. But these, when they're dry, have 
a like pinkish uh, white striation to them, so that's what makes them different. But these are actually found in Italy, and like I said, you can get them in an Italian market. And we are going to add some stock. And you don't want to add so much stock that you know, you're getting mostly broth when you take a spoon. You want all these vegetables to get in there, so you don't want to use a whole lot of stock. I use two cups here. I'm going to add tomato paste. That's going to thicken the sauce and add some additional tomato flavor. And this is just regular tomato paste, not roasted. You could add roasted tomato paste if you want to add that kind of smoky flavor to it. You've got some beautiful color in here, the red, the orange, the green. And you wanna make sure that this is just simmered slowly. I mean, you don't wanna bring it to a rolling boil. The longer you cook the vegetables, you want them to just be tender or even crisp tender. The more you cook them, the more the nutrients cook out of them. So I like to be able to have some texture to my um, vegetables in a soup. With that said, the pasta that we're using, this is a ditalini. So you wanna use small pasta in your soups. You could use this, you could use a trophy pasta um, and kind of break it up. Um, didalini, they're kind of like little round cylinders. Cook this about two minutes under whatever the package says if you're using a dried pasta because you don't want this to overcook in the broth and get mushy. So we'll add that in. And then once this gets warm and simmers for a little while, we'll add in our greens. At this point, to get that flavor, we're gonna take the rind of the pecorino and put that in as well. And that's gonna add a nice, rich flavor to the soup. Okay, to finish off, we're gonna add in our greens. And remember, these are gonna wilt down. So when you first put them in, it might seem like you need to add more stock, but once they soften and cook down, I think you'll be fine. If you did need to add a little bit more once these um, wilt down, you can add a little bit of water or just more stock. So in the northern part of Italy, it's, it's very traditional to eat some pesto on top of your minestrone. So we're gonna learn how to make a traditional uh, pesto genovese from the Genoa region of Italy. Um, depending on what kind of blender you have, you may want to start off slow and move it to a higher speed. Um, this one sounds like a race car. So I'm actually going to pulse to get started and then we'll get it going um, once we get the oil in. I'm going to remove the cap from the lid, that way I can pour the oil in as we're zhuzhing. Okay, so we're going to start with some um, fresh basil, and it's, you need to be careful not to over-process this because the basil will lose its color. So, and of course, this is fresh basil, unlike my last name, basil, which is spelled different, B-A-J-S-E-L. <laughs> but we're gonna start with that. I've got Parmesan and Pecorino, and we're using pine nuts. Um, some people don't like the taste of pine nuts. Um, sometimes they say they get a metallic taste in their mouth from it. So if you're one of those people, um, you could use walnuts in this pesto, but pine nuts are traditional. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna start just by pulsing that and get it kind of chopped up. Maybe. Oh, it's starting to. There we go. And let's put a little olive oil in there. Maybe that'll help go. Help it go a little bit fast, there we go. So, depending on what kind of blender you have at home, I like a Vitamix, personally. We added some Parmesan and Pecorino. A lot of people just add Parmesan, but to really make an authentic um, pesto, you wanna add both cheeses. And I'm gonna need some more olive oil, so let me get a little bit more. Okay, see if we can make this work. Normally I would drizzle that in, but because of my blender issues, we're gonna dump a bunch in just to get this started. 
Come on, Dave. There we go. She's going. Yay. <laughs> so you're going to add drizzle based on consistency, but this actually is about the consistency that you want. You don't want it too oily. It'll fall apart into the soup. You kind of want it to kind of sit on the soup so that you can stir it in. And notice I did not add any salt. The cheese has salt content in it. They are, um, have some salty flavorness, so I would do it without salt, taste it, and then if you need to add a little bit of salt to it, you can always add that after, but I wouldn't start by putting salt in this. Okay, our pesto's ready. And our soup's been simmering, so that's probably ready, so let's plate it. Okay, so our soup's been simmering. Everything's ready to go. I like to add a little bit of butter to the end. It kind of creates some unctuousness, just like a silky mouthfeel. So we're gonna put a little bit of butter, stir it up before we plate it. And also, an interesting fact, in Northern Italy, they actually use more butter than they do olive oil. You start to see olive oil being used more in Central and Southern Italy. So just a fun fact. Okay, so I'm gonna take my little, about a tablespoon, dollop, mix that in. I did not pull out the pecorino rind, so I'm gonna make sure that that doesn't get in the bowl because I don't think anybody wants to gnaw on the end of a rind of cheese. Okay, so that's melted in. It's a beautiful soup, lots of color, lots of vegetables. Get a little bit more of the tomato broth in there. Give me one second, because I'm a perfectionist, so I want that to be a pretty plate. And by the way, this is what chefs and restaurants do. So don't feel bad if you spill this on at home, because this is all they do. They take a little towel and they just wipe it off. And you're like, how did they get that in there so perfectly? Now you know. Okay, we've got our beautiful pesto. Just take a dollop of that, put it right there in the center and then your guests can stir that in to create that herby flavor in the soup when they're ready to eat. So our asabuco has been braising for a few hours. It's ready to be plated. So I'm going to remove the veal shanks and these should be falling apart. So just be careful when you put them on the plate. They're nice and tender. Oh, they're so pretty. Look at that, beautiful. Okay, now you're wondering what we're gonna do with all this liquid. We're actually going to make a sauce out of that and because we used vegetables, the vegetables will actually thicken the sauce without us having to reduce it or add a um, slurry to it, which would be like a flour water mixture to thicken it. So I'm just double checking to make sure I got all the herbs out. I mean, unless you like to eat twigs and get a little fiber in your diet. There's one, I knew I missed one. So you wanna pull those out. And then we are going to put that in our trusted blender. It's a hot liquid, so if you're brave enough to pick up your pan and pour it in, you can do it that way. I'm gonna just ladle it in. And you wanna make sure you're getting all those vegetables because again, that's what's gonna thicken the sauce. And if you feel like you've got a little bit too much liquid um, and your sauce is gonna to be too thin, you can strain out the vegetables to finish it. Let's put that on. I need a top for my blender because with my luck, I'd zhuzh it all over me. And this I am gonna start slower. And just let that go until that gets nice and um, blended so you don't have any chunks. And if you want to make a really interesting um, dish from this dish, I have pulled the meat apart before and mixed it with the sauce and put it on a bun and made an asabuco sloppy joe with it as well. Just another way to eat it. Okay, so let's take a little bit of the sauce. Got all those nice vegetables grown in. It's gonna have a great flavor. Just look at that, it's beautiful, ladled over. 
the top of the asabuco. And now you know what time it is, right? It's time to have a nice glass of red wine with the asabuco. I'm gonna have the same wine, actually, that I put in the dish because we know it'll pair. Oh, that's a, that's a Jennifer pour. <laughs> Cheers. I had so much fun cooking with you today. I hope you had fun at home as well. So if you would like to find these recipes or my other Italian recipes, you can go to jenniferbasil.com and my last name is spelled B-A-J-S-E-L so you can find me when you Google search. Thanks again for joining me.